I do think this is a particularly important topic. Social and economic impacts of gambling is central to the entire business of gambling. Is this a good or bad thing? That uh, um, for many years, and still to some extent currently, there was no consensus on what to measure in terms of gambling impacts, how to measure it, and how to aggregate the impacts. And it was that um, confusion that led to a commission by the Canadian Consortium of, uh, uh, for Gambling Research for myself and a couple of colleagues, Jurgen Rem and uh, uh, Reese Stevens, to try and find a way out of this, to do an exhaustive research of, first of all, the impacts, what we know about the impacts, and to propose a theoretical framework that makes sense, that was simple, and that could be used by other people. And I'm going to talk about both of those things today. And it's quite a challenge in 30 minutes because this covers an overall theoretical framework for conducting socioeconomic impact studies, a framework that I've used in British Columbia, Alberta, and that we're going to be using in Massachusetts, and a framework that has been used largely in uh, a handful of the better socioeconomic studies worldwide. And secondly, a uh, snapshot view of the established impacts in all the different areas uh, that are going to make impact. So it's a, a daunting task, and I think it's quite exciting. So methodological considerations first. First question is what to measure. Uh, new, any new socioeconomic, any ac uh, economic activity really has pervasive social economic impact, uh, ripple effects through the economy. Um, despite this, it's fairly typical, a lot of the poor quality socioeconomic impact studies have only measured economic impact. Things like jobs and revenue, things that are easily quantifiable in monetary terms. Or, um, and there's many examples of that. The industry is particularly good at putting out these reports talking about the so-called socioeconomic benefits of gambling, really just focusing on the economic aspect. Obviously, this creates a very unbalanced analysis and the economic gains lost are not measured against social cost benefits. So it's fairly straightforward that the first principle of a good socioeconomic impact study is to measure both social uh, impact and economic impact. And this is a elucidation of the various economic indices and social indices that you can use that we've used in Massachusetts and other jurisdictions in order to identify what needs to be measured in each niche area. I won't go over these in detail, but there's many different organizations of the social impact and the economic impact. The important thing is not that you have the exact same list, but that you comprehensively assess all the social impacts, all the economic impacts. How to measure the impacts. Now, this is an important issue because the traditional approach in which we have is to use money as a common metric. Um, and while that's very appropriate for, uh, for measuring and quantifying economic changes, it's, it's fairly inappropriate and arguably crass to measure a lot of social impacts. It's a bit crass to talk about the cost of a suicide in terms of funeral costs. That's only a small fraction of the total impact. Um, there are many impacts such as psychic trauma of being a problem gambler, or intergenerational uh, impact that being a, a problem gambler has that are not adequately captured. The reality is that most problem gamblers don't seek out formal treatment and don't incur costs on the healthcare system. And you're missing all those costs or all those impacts if you simply look at the monetary consequence. Now this issue is not restricted to gambling. It's widespread dissatisfaction with it. <coughs> it's a, a financial industry is measuring societal progress. And so the United Nations, I mean, gross domestic product is another measure of that. It's basically the total amount of purchases, sales in a, in a, um, in a, uh, you know, jurisdiction in a, a certain time period. Uh, and again, that's a reasonable measure of, of economic activity, but it's not a good overall measure of societal progress or advancement, or it's a, it's a circumscribed measure. And so many different organizations, from the United Nations uh, and, and many other individual organizations have proposed alternatives to that, quality of life indices, well-being indices, et cetera, et cetera. Um, there are problems to each of those approaches, unfortunately. The fact that you have such an incredible variability of these alternative uh, uh, approaches points to the main problem. There's not well agreed upon idea about what constitutes societal progress, what measures should be combined to produce an overall 
progress in the theater for society. So the language issue is how to measure the impacts. Now, obviously, you need a metric that best captures the impact. Now, money is, uh, we, we argue, is the best metric for most economic changes as well as social changes with monetary costs. However, other social impacts are best captured and described in more straightforward ways. So what we've done in various jurisdictions is simply talk about the percent change in theater product. Let's not try to change that to some arbitrary monetary cost. Simply report it as it is. Percent change in theater price, percent change in uh, divorces, uh, crime, etc. Now, again, the advantage of common metrics such as money is it allows you to combine all impacts into aggregate uh, value. That's the approach of cost-benefit analysis. However, as I mentioned, CBAs are problematic because of difficulty applying money to social changes and because it requires everything either to be a cost or a benefit. That's another main issue that there are many changes that occur as a result of gambling introduction. There are changes in the um, profile and nature of the industries that some industries are cannibalized with the introduction of gambling, other uh, industries are, um, are created because of gambling availability. And you have change in tax revenue, and it's, and it's questionable whether these are good or bad. And having a cost benefit implies there's a positive or negative valence to these things, when the reality is several impacts are simply changes. And so it's, it's much better to talk about impact analysis. So, Getting back to these other indices I talked about, the Human Development Index, Quality of Life Index, uh, arguably are more theoretically satisfying, that's why these things have been proposed, but here again, these somewhat subjective and arbitrary due to the lack of agreement of the relative value or weighting of, of you know, environmental considerations versus uh, uh, tax revenue, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And furthermore, they make the same mistake as cost-benefit analysis, which is aspiring to combine everything into a singular impact. And that necessarily requires some subjectivity because what the, you know, the, it's impossible to get consensus on what five suicides is worth compared to $200 million in economic gain. You're never gonna get agreement on the relative value of social changes relative to economic changes. And so the most straightforward and neutral approach is simply to look at the profile of impacts. Things that can be quantified in monetary terms should be in, in a classic cost-benefit approach and aggregated um, into that singular index. But everything else is percent change, percent change in suicide, percent change in crime. The end result is a profile of impact. And then you have, you, you make it clear that the ultimate determination about whether gambling is good or bad is in fact somewhat subjective, depending on your own viewpoint. Now you can take that a step further, we've done that in a couple of jurisdictions, that you provide that profile of the impacts in British Columbia and you select a random sample of 100 people of that province and that get them to see, come to an aggregate judgment about whether they think it's good or bad. But you, make, but you need to make it clear that your job as a, analyst is to identify and aggregate the, uh, the impacts as best you can. And you do that by creating a profile. And that's what we do in Massachusetts as well. You also have to apply basic economic principles to evaluate the economic impact. Now, you keep on hearing about gambling costs this much or gambling costs that much. There are two or three basic principles of economic development that need to be adhered to when understanding whether gambling has a true economic value. One is if there's true influx of wealth from outside the jurisdiction. So I've mentioned before that places such as Nevada, Macau, uh, experience true economic um, value from gambling because you have an influx of uh, revenue from outside the jurisdiction. It's not revenue that's been cannibalized and recirculated from other retail, retail sectors. Rather, you've add, added to the wealth of the jurisdiction by this influx of new money. And in situations like that, you have an unambiguous positive economic uh, uh, benefit. You have economic benefit if the economic activity increases the value of existing assets for manufacturing um, sectors that create something of value, a car industry that creates something of value from raw material that's worth more than the raw material. It's creating wealth within the jurisdiction. And the third basic principle by which you can create economic uh, utility in a jurisdiction is increased circulation of money. 
so that uh, if money is being circulated in a more rapid fashion amongst people within the jurisdiction, there's greater utility for that economic activity. And so those are the only ways in which you can have true economic value, and that needs to be applied to dam rate value. How large a geographic area to assess? Most social economic impact studies in this space will focus around a very um, specific area where dam rates provided, and they may see an increase in jobs and an increase in revenue, but for the most part, gambling usually involves a fairly sterile transfer of wealth, and the economic gains in one jurisdiction are usually at the economic expense of neighboring jurisdictions, and so you need to take a more macro view of the impacts. Similarly, um, most economic activities add upon previous economic activities. And so, um, uh, as I say, the new gambling venues are always added to existing gambling opportunities, even if illegal, but a lag effect of these previous ones uh, can be mistaken for the immediate effects of the new ones. So that a, um, uh, a, a good quality socioeconomic impact analysis has a long time span, both many years before and many years after. And again, we know that the social impacts of gambling often take many years to manifest themselves. Many of the economic ones are more immediate, but again, if you have a circumscribed time window to assess the impacts, you're artificially constraining the, um, the, uh, uh, the impacts that, that can be ob observed. Difficulties in isolating the effects of gambling. Um, most socioeconomic impact studies simply do pre-post uh, analyses, but that ignores the fact there are many other uh, things in a uh, society and an economy that cause uh, economic and social changes at that time. It's very difficult to attribute those changes just to gambling. A much stronger methodology when you is when you have a control community, where you compare the changes in this community getting the gambling venues against the match control community that didn't get gambling. Now that's often easier said than done. It's very difficult to find exactly comparable communities because there's often attitudinal differences in communities that have chosen the gambling venues versus communities that haven't. But nonetheless, you should still aspire to do such a thing. Impacts are somewhat specific to different segments of society. And I did a Google image search for cultural diversity and it gave me village people. And so that sort of makes the point. Um, but uh, the lack of a significant community-wide change does not necessarily address subpopulation impact. So um, the reality is that Gambling tends to be a fairly small economic activity in a large economy, and that it's not unusual that jurisdiction-wide socioeconomic impact studies fail to show significant changes in jobs, significant changes in overall uh, tax revenue, because gambling is relatively small in most jurisdictions most of the time. And some studies have uh, then therefore concluded that gambling has no impact. But the reality is that gambling affects a small segment of society. And this is a, uh, evidence of, of what must be happening. If 2% of the population experienced a 100% increase in bankruptcy rates subsequent to new gambling availability, this change cannot be statistically detected uh, uh, at a jurisdiction-wide level if there's no change in over 98%. But if you have a sufficient sample size to look at the changes in the vulnerable group, groups that you expect that will be impacted, that's where you'll see the changes. So you need to have large enough sample size to analyze both subgroup effects as well as population-wide effects. Impact is somewhat specific to the type of gambling, different forms of gambling, uh, have different propensities to problem gambling, different amounts of economic spin-offs, things like horse racing. There's a large chain of um, farmers, breeders, etc. There's no more job associated with that compared to electronic gambling machines, which often reduce employment. They're, they, um, they often cost jobs because they're an automated device. Um, and similarly, lotteries versus EGMs have different potentials to problem gambling. So you also need to qualify your results as being very specific to the type of gambling. Impacts are somewhat specific to jurisdiction studies. So different jurisdictions have different prevention programs in place already. Um, different jurisdictions have different vulnerabilities of the, of the population. Different jurisdictions have different current levels of gambling availability. There is some truth to the fact that uh, um, ex on uh, long-term exposure to gambling somewhat inoculates people to the, the negative effects. And so introducing 
casinos and jurisdictions never had casinos before is going to be a lot different than introducing five more casinos to jurisdictions that have already had many casinos. Impacts are somewhat specific to time period study. Gambling availability and gambling policy can change rapidly within jurisdictions. Population has become older. We have different rates of problem gambling. Regulation has more recently introduced it. So again, this is just qualifying the results but may not be generalizable beyond that particular time period. The last point is comparison point. Most studies have simply um, examined the economic and social changes from before the introduction of gambling and after, but and that's important, and you do that also for the control community, but in addition to that, what you need to do is speculate on what would have happened if gambling had not been introduced. This is actually the usual motivation for introduction of gambling. If we don't do it, we're gonna continue losing money to the neighboring jurisdiction. And so there needs to be some projection of what extent, to what extent that's true, because that provides an additional comparison point. So it's not particularly complicated, and it's, I've made it as simple as possible, but those are just basic good quality principles of doing a socioeconomic impact study. And uh, um, again, that's all elucidated in that report, and uh, uh, that's what we're using in Massachusetts, and that's what other jurisdictions have, uh, have glommed on to. So we're hoping that this has a, an, an ongoing impact on the field. Now the second part of this, this uh, commission research was to analyze all the existing studies. So there's 492 studies collected from the early 70s up to 2012 um, that we included all studies that have had examined either direct or indirect social or economic impacts of any form of gambling. Studies were characterized in certain things whether they're methodological studies, scoping studies, or empirical studies with actual results. And what this book has drawn is that latter, that 292. Should mention that within that, when you apply basic principles of uh, quality that incorporate these, uh, these things I've identified, there's really only a handful of studies, including, uh, there's only a, a handful of studies worldwide that have really been said to be good quality. Um, six, no, seven. Seven studies out of these uh, 293 that really were characterized as excellent studies that ascribe to those, those principles. So we're gonna talk about the impacts of each of these areas, government revenue. This is actually the most reliable impact of gambling, which is probably why governments are so enamored with gambling. That increase in government revenue uh, generally occurs across all forms of gambling. There's occasional circumstances where a new form of cuts in the revenue, the old form, a new form is not contributing to government revenue. U.S. Indian Casino is the best example of that. Um, and there's circumstances where, depending on the revenue distribution, that one level of government might benefit at the expense of other levels. But the reality is, governments almost always win with gambling. Now, governments are in the business of providing public services to its citizens, so it's not surprising that uh, uh, at least a, a, an increase or a stabilization or um, uh, not a reduction maintenance of public services is also a fairly reliable impact of gambling reduction. That being said, there are circumstances where gambling revenue is to used to avoid raising taxes or to reduce the government debt or just to maintain services. Um, and that in some jurisdictions where you have charity gambling, such as bingo, um, existing new forms of gambling, casinos and EGM will often cut into those older forms and so uh, the extent to which charities provide public services that can be a negative impact, but generally reduce the enhancement of public services. Regulatory costs, there's consistent increase in government regulatory costs for the introduction of new forms of gambling, or at least, I mean, because you have to administer this new form, or at least costs usually much less than the revenue the government gains from gambling. Infrastructure value. Construction of new gambling venues adds to the infrastructure wealth of the community. Um, and that's uh, especially true when you have associated hotel complexes being built uh, coincident with this. But the reality is the magnitude of this infrastructure value increase is usually small ex in exception of when these new venues are placed in impoverished communities. But there is, for certain forms of gambling, horse racing and casinos, obviously not internet gambling or perhaps bingo or uh, EGMs spread out through uh, 
various uh, lounges, but certain forms of damage you were liable to increase infrastructure value to some small extent. Infrastructure costs. Um, these, uh, introduction new, of a new venue usually produces some infrastructure costs because a new casino will, will tax the, uh, uh, the util uh, utilization of sewer, roads, electricity, et cetera, et cetera, and police, fire, and public transport. Here again, the magnitude of these costs sort of depends on the extent to which the cost is taken up by the government, which is often the case, uh, especially in new equipment governments, relative to the casino developer. Here again, the costs tend to be relatively small uh, relative to gambling revenue and, and uh, usually offset by the increased infrastructure value. So infrastructure costs tend to be there for certain forms of venue-based gambling, but they're not large and they tend to be offset by the increased infrastructure value. Impacts on other businesses. This is a pretty critical one. Um, that uh, business revenue, new business starts, and employment usually increase, but only when the patron base is from outside the jurisdiction. Um, and that's particularly true in the numbers of the case. It's large. Uh, visitation requires overnight stays as opposed to just coming in and going back. Uh, and the hospitality industry uh, tends to be the biggest beneficiary. However, when patron base is local, there is usually a negative impact for a wide range of other businesses. Largely what you have is cannibalization of other businesses. There's a basic principle of economic benefits that I'll be talking about over and over again here. That the overall benefit for gambling very much depend on whether the money is coming from outside or whether it's being redirected, cannibalized from inside. Now the other thing to recognize though is regardless of patron origin, the benefit for gambling venues, other businesses, and other specific geographic areas usually occurs at the expense of other business sectors and or geographic areas so that places that are sending tourists are losing the money from their own jurisdiction because uh, people are dropping money in the, in the neighboring jurisdiction. The point to make there is the only time that uh, substitution cannibalization does not always occur is in the first few years of gambling introduction because that can actually spur this increased speed of monetary uh, transfer. Any new economic product often has a stimulant effect on the economy in that the increased circulation of money within that economy and that creates greater utilization. Gambling has the ability to do that in a few circumstances, but it's usually very temporary. The basic principle of gambling is a sterile transfer of wealth, so you need the wealth to come from outside if you want any benefit. Personal income, gambling introduction is without has any impact on personal income. The only exception to that, in North America, you have a lot of native-owned casinos and that there's unambiguous economic benefit in terms of personal income increasing uh, to many of those uh, communities. Property value, no clear impact there. Sometimes increases property value, sometimes has no impact, and very much depends on how impoverished the area is um, and whether the casinos have rele relegated to uh, industrial zones or not. Social industry, problem gambling relatedness is usually equally important, obviously. There is a reliable increase in problem gambling subsequent to gambling introduction, but usually only the first few years after introduction of any new form of gambling. The other caveat thing to realize here is the legal availability of gambling is only partly responsible for the prevalence of problem gambling. Problem gambling existed to some extent prior, and problem gambling is only partly responsible for some of these consequences of mental health and uh, substance use uh, comorbidities, which are very common in problem gambling policy communities. So this is one of the most reliable uh, uh, indices, but there is some truth to the fact that the, the impacts diminish with time. Crime. This is a complex one. It could be an hour session in and of itself. The, uh, the overall results here suggest that crime does increase to a small extent, but you do generally find a decrease in illegal gambling activity. So I won't go that into great detail, but generally, yes.